Good morning, church. Good morning. Wonderful morning and wonderful Sunday. Truly, God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Amen. I am the chosen one. I am the great one. You don't believe in me? I am God's chosen one to save you from your sins. I am the one. Still don't believe me? Oh. What do we have here? Okay. I will show you that I am the chosen one of God. To save you from your sins. I will show you. Just plain water inside this Ziploc. Watch. I hope I won't mess this thing up. I practice this. What's the magic word? <laughs> All right. And that's where you will say, ah. <laughs> you don't still believe me? That I am the chosen one? One more. And this time you will say, ooh. <laughs> I am the chosen one. I am the one who will save you from your sins. You don't still believe me? I've showed you a miracle, a sign, a wonder. Can anybody do this? It's only me. Okay. All right. Put that down. <laughs> now, it is common to hear people say, I'm waiting for a sign from heaven. Okay. And sometimes we put our future from the sign from up above, right? Even our uh, love life. We put our love life into the so-called signs or miracles, you know. But if you ask these people, what signs are you waiting for? Or what signs are you looking for? They don't have any idea. To be honest, they don't have any idea. What are you looking for? A sign. What kind of sign? I don't have any idea. But just a sign from the Lord. Okay. And again, just like some of my uh, uh, friends, their love life, they're looking for a sign for the one. Okay. Now, we are familiar with the story of uh, how Isaac, uh, got her wife, um, Rebecca, okay, for his wife. Abraham sent out his uh, servant to go out in the field to find uh, Isaac a wife. And then this servant went out, and as he went out, he prayed to God. He prayed to God that whoever gave him and his camel a drink would be the one for his master Isaac. And then lo and behold, comes Rebecca. She came out to the spring and gave the servant a drink and also his camels. See, now the rest was history. Now fast forward, there was these two friends. One is a married guy, one is an unmarried guy. And this unmarried guy, he was at the uh, outside this store, shopping store, and uh, his friend saw him and the married man Asked his friend, what are you doing outside the store? And this unmarried man told his friend, well, I asked God for a sign. And God told me to be here at exactly 12 noon. Because the first woman that will come out of that store, that gate, will be the one. 
Then all of a sudden, a woman came out, an elderly woman came out. <laughs> and the little guy said, buddy, that's the one. No, he's not. <laughs> Probably the second woman. Then the second woman came out. A married woman with, his, with her husband and her children. And then the unmarried guy said, definitely not her. Of course, definitely not her. And then another woman, the third woman, came out. Well, probably this will be the third woman. The third woman came out, and the woman, uh, she's in her um, middle age, probably 40, around the same age as them. And uh, the woman, oh, I forgot. One of the terms should be the woman will be smiling at him. The first woman to smile at him. And this woman, the third woman that came out, he, she was smiling at this unmarried guy. And then his friend told him, buddy, that's the guy. No, she's not. She's not my type. Oh, but she's smiling. I'm not looking. <laughs> I'm not looking. And then finally, the fourth woman came out. And she was beautiful. She was young. And this unmarried guy was all attention to her. And he was smiling at her giving her best smile, uh, giving his best smile. And the woman, she isn't smiling. And the friend said, buddy, that's not her. She's not smiling. She will smile back at me. Just wait, she will, she will smile. And then until the woman reaches her car and never smiled back at him. Then they went home sad. Okay. Another story, there was a great flood, a great flood. And the water keeps on rising. When the water was knee deep, all the people in the in the community they all uh, evacuated except for this guy. The people are coming up to him. They're asking him, "Come on, let's evacuate. The water is getting higher and higher. You will drown. You will die." And then this guy said, "No. I talk to my God, and my God will save me. Okay? And God will save me. He will do a miracle to save me." And then when the water was really high, a, uh, a boat passes by, by his house. And with the police inside that boat, they were shouting at him, come on, come jump right in. You'll drown, you'll die. The water's getting higher and higher. No, I believe in my God. My God told me he will rescue me. And then the water is roof onto the roof, roof high. And there was a chopper. And the, the guy with the, with the uh, microphone or megaphone, come on, take the rope, you will die. And then the man said, no, my God will save me. He told me, he will save me, he will do miracle, he will save me. And then eventually he died. And then when he died in the afterlife, he saw his God that he was talking to. And then he was angry, he was so furious. I thought you would save me. I waited for you, but you never came. So I died. And his God told him, but you're not listening. I sent those neighbors to you. I even rent a boat for you. I even rent out a chopper for you, but you never listen. You stubborn man. So that's why you die. See, people are looking for miracles up to this very moment, you know. And sometimes we will be disappointed. And oftentimes we will be disappointed. You know, it's because it happened in the Bible. Does it mean it would be the same way today? It doesn't mean that God talks directly to the people then. It would mean that he will be talking to us the same way. That there would be a voice from heaven talking directly to you. Marcus, Marcus, get up. <laughs> See, but God has his purpose why it was the way it was. And unfortunately, even for our salvation, there are those waiting for a miracle from heaven for them to believe and follow Jesus Christ. 
but I showed you a miracle. Do you believe that I am the one? <laughs> now, this morning, we will be talking about are you still looking for signs, miracles, and wonders? Okay. Signs, miracles, and wonders occur both in the Old and the New Testament. There are times that they are abuse. Okay. They are abuse, giving false hopes to many people. Likewise, they are used for profit. And I have seen people use this trickery to amass themselves with profit. Okay. Now, so many people have been deceived by such a claim of a miracle. I think the worst case of all is when we delay our salvation waiting for a sign to come before, uh, to come before us so we can come before God and heed his call for repentance. And many have exploited this, uh, this kind of theology, this kind of trickery, I would say, leading many to the wrong directions. Now, what is miracle? According to Bible themes, defines miracles as events, signs, and wonders, or experiences that demonstrate God's greatness and power. Now, miracles defy the usual laws of nature and indicate the supernatural at work. According to Webster, an event or effect contrary to the established constitution and course of things, or a deviation from known laws of nature, a supernatural event or one transcending the ordinary laws by which the universe is governed. Now, putting all those together, miracles is the occurrence of an event or happening that is directly attributable to God through his divine power defying the ordinary laws of nature and contrary to the established norms. One thing that I will want to point out is the word attributable okay? meaning that we can easily point the miracle directly to god as part of the volition of god as part of the choice of god now one example would be the 10 plagues now this one of this is one of the earliest miracles in the bible the 10 plagues we can directly attribute that or explain how the miracles came about Basically, it was all came from God. It was God's doing. Now, if you're going to read um, Exodus chapter 4, we can see that God made all of those things happen. God was directly involved in the 10 plagues. We don't have to exert so much of an effort to explain how it came to be. We just tell the people that God made it happen. That's how simple it is. God made it happen, you know. Now, the second thing that I want to point out is the word, the words divine power. Okay. Happening that is directly attributable to God through his divine power. Now, miracles in the Bible came to be because of God's power alone. Okay. The divine power of God means limitless. It means without end, limit, or boundary. He can do <clears throat> anything he wishes. You know, not like today's miracle, so-called miracle workers. They are limited. They are so limited. I remember one time um, back home, there was this a, uh, a gathering of people because there, one, there was this one so-called miracle worker who claimed to heal many diseases so upon hearing that many people gathered and they were shoving they were pushing because they want all to be healed unfortunately one person got a heart attack okay. instead of calling the so-called miracle worker and try to heal that person they called the ambulance they called an ambulance and they rushed him to the hospital and the doctor was, uh, was thinking, what happened to him? So they relayed the story, and the doctor said, why did you bring him to me? Why did you not bring him to that miracle worker? He is just up in the stage, a few meters away. And you brought this patient 
far away and he's dead. See, God's divine power is limitless. It is without boundary, without limit. But the so-called miracle workers, they are limited if, if they are even true. Now, again, the third thing that I want to point out is the word defying. Okay, the word defying. Defying the ordinary laws of nature and contrary to established norms. Okay, defying. The word defy means to go beyond or to challenge, okay, to challenge the thoughts, to challenge the norms. In the case of miracles, it goes beyond the norms. Now, a classic example is bringing a dead person to life. How can we even explain that? Okay. It, is, it defies the norm, defies logic. It goes beyond understanding, defies the human norms. Now, only logical, the only logical explanation for that dead person coming to life is because God made it happen, just like what Jesus did to Lazarus and to the Jairus' daughter. Now, in all of those three, miracle is attributable to God. God is directly involved. It is by God's divine power being limitless, and it defies natural laws and established norms. Now, what is the purpose? What is the purpose of the so-called miracles in the Bible? Number one, to believe in God. Believe in God. First Kings chapter 18, 37, 39. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. This is the story of the face-to-face -face of Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal by King Ahab. Okay. So the, the first phase of was they have bought an animal, a bull, they cut it off into pieces and they put it on top of the wood. Both of them, the 450 prophets by the so-called gods and Elijah. And then they will both pray to their God. Okay. And whoever, whoever set fire on that sacrifice, his God is the true God. So the 450 prophets of King Ahab, they prayed to their gods. They prayed, they prayed, and prayed. And even Elijah told them, keep praying, keep, keep shouting. Your God is not hearing you. Keep shouting. So probably he's sleeping. And then Elijah prayed to God. And then God sent forth fire. And it happened. So the people, after they saw the miracles right before their very eyes, they prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord he is God. They believe in God. The second purpose of miracle in the Bible is in Exodus chapter 4, verse 5. To believe in God's messenger. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God and their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Okay. This is the time when uh, the Israelites were about to be freed by God. So the, 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 uh, the signs, the miracles that God did with Moses, it was a sign so that the Pharaoh would believe in the messenger of God, which is Moses. Now we have this culture, the culture of to cease to believe, right? To cease to believe culture. It existed long time ago. Even when God chose Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, he equipped Moses with, with these abilities, you know, directly coming from God, so that the Pharaoh would know that Moses is a servant coming from God. So that Pharaoh would know that Moses represents God. Because Moses knew that without any proof at all coming from God, or something that would you know, stand out, something that he would make 
something that would that is extraordinary the pharaoh would not believe him and would probably just laugh at him and belittle him so that's why god made miracles through moses and the miracles accompanying god's servants were meant to prove they were chosen by god for a particular purpose okay. now when jesus came to this world they did not believe jesus christ that he was the the messiah that he was the king of kings so why is that why is that the people did not believe jesus christ now let's start from the beginning from his birth in matthew chapter 2. Okay. after jesus was born in bethlehem in judea during the time of king herod a okay, maggie from the east came to jerusalem and asked where is the one who has been born king of the jews we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him you know this maggie or wise man came they came to herod and asked herod where is the one who has been born king of the jews now what do you think uh what what king herod felt you know they came to him he was the king and asked for a king <laughs> see herod felt probably he was annoyed probably probably he was angry at this maggie he was like hey who who am i who am i then am i not the king can't you see the crown can't you see the robe that i'm wearing am i not the king who do you think i am a clown or a jester you know probably he would, was was thinking uh that thought and probably his mind going haywire because there was a king a new king aside from me are you kidding me you know so he was probably have that thought and the news that there is this new king born angered Herod. So he wanted the baby boy Jesus dead. Okay. Jesus was a threat. The reason why people didn't believe in Jesus Christ because he was a threat. He was a threat at all level. When you are a king, of course you will have a kingdom. Herod misunderstood what kind of kingdom and what kind of a king Jesus would be. It was not a political kind of kingdom, but a spiritual kind of kingdom. But regardless of spiritual or political, you know, Herod saw Jesus as a threat to power. He probably knew that in the event, you know, Jesus would grow up. Jesus would draw a, a, a great followings that could later oust him as their king so he was afraid so he saw jesus was a threat now aside from him the pharisees the scribes and even the sadducees they hated jesus because they were being exposed by jesus christ okay? they hated jesus because they fear jesus and they are they were jealous of jesus because jesus at the time he was having so much followers people are coming up to jesus christ and they are losing followers now in matthew chapter 23 woe to you teachers of the law and pharisees you hypocrites you are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean in the same way on the outside you appear to people as righteous but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness jesus was exposing them <clears throat> that's why they did not like jesus christ they jesus christ was a threat so the miracles and powers that jesus displayed it was they were all meant to persuade people that he was indeed the messiah that he was indeed the savior that he was indeed the king of kings as we can see in the following verses now when he was in jerusalem and at the passover during the feast many believed in his name 
when they saw the signs which he did. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. John 11, 45. So it was meant that the miracles of Jesus was meant for people to believe in him. That's number three. Number four, miracles, an opportunity to preach the gospel. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 5, the blind receive, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. In the case of Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, Let's start with 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his households. These miracles, these signs, these supernatural events caused by God were a means to preach the gospel during those times in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It was meant to bring forth the gospel now during those times you know there were no bible yet like what we have today okay? the miracles exist for the sake of the gospel let me repeat that the miracle exists for the sake of the gospel it points people to the word it points people to god it points people to jesus but I did you a miracle. Believe in me. <laughs> miracle workers, I would say, you know, normally they, they, they point their fingers to themselves, claiming to be the one sent forth by God. You know, there was, there is this one person in the Philippines, unfortunately. Until now, he's alive. He claimed to be the son of God. Well, we are, we are all sons and daughters of God. But he claimed to be the one higher than Jesus Christ. And he can stop the earthquake. <laughs> and he can make things happen. And there was this one statement that he made I read over the social media that he will be the one judging the people. Very unfortunate. You see, the, the miracles were meant to point us to the right direction. The miracles were, point, were meant to point us towards God, towards Jesus Christ and no one else. Now you see what happened to Paul and to Silas during when they were in prison. There was, an, there was an earthquake. The cell doors suddenly opened and the chains fell and they were cut loose. See, how can you even explain that? But Paul and Silas used that supernatural, that signs of miracles from God, that event coming from God to bring the people, to bring this God and his family <clears throat> towards the gospel. They did not point themselves to that household. No, they point Jesus. They point the household to the gospel. And these people were saved. But of course, <clears throat> with many miracles the people saw during that time, many still did not believe in Jesus Christ and his apostles. In John chapter 12, 37, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him so unfortunate they have seen right before their very eyes but still they did not believe in jesus christ now still with many signs and wonders jesus did 
the Pharisees and the teachers of the law ask him for a sign. They ask him for a sign even though they saw it with their own eyes, even though they are witnessed themselves to these miracles that Jesus did. Now, we read in Mark chapter 8, then the Pharisees came and began to argue with Jesus, testing him by demanding from him a sign from heaven. Jesus sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation demand a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this <clears throat> generation. Now, in a similar account, we find in Matthew chapter 12, 39 and 40, he answered, a wicked and adulterous generation ask for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, this time Jesus said, none will be given to them except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, Jesus, he was alluding to what had happened to Jonah. And he was referring to his death and his resurrection. Now, it will be Jesus' grand display of power. It will be Jesus' last act on earth. And it will be full of power and it will be full of authority. Now, signs, miracles, and wonders were meant for you to have life. They were meant for us to have salvation. Now, Jesus' grand miracle, a parallel with that of Jonah, as we have read in Matthew chapter 12. As we can see, Jonah... He was sent to Nineveh, a wicked city, and preached against it for their sins. Jesus, on the other hand, sent to this world, a wicked world, and preached against it for its sins. Second, Jonah, he was swallowed by a great fish. In parallel, Jesus died. He was, in a way, swallowed by the earth. He died. The number three, Jonah spent three days and three nights inside the great fish. With Jesus, he spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We know that Jesus died. Died. And he was buried for three days. And after three days, Jonah vomited out upon dry land. Jesus, after three days, he rose from the dead. A parallel with that of Jonah. And that's what Jesus was referring to when he talks about none except the signs of Jonah. And this indeed will be the great and grand miracle of Jesus, the final act of Jesus Christ. Mark 15, 39, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. When Jesus ultimately showed his final act, I would say his miracle, his death on the cross, this centurion saw it, and he said, surely this man was the son, the son of God. You see, the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ showcased Jesus' power, Jesus' authority, and Jesus' power over death. Power over life, power of life, immortality, power over death. He rose again from the dead. Now, the very difference between Christianity and other world religion is this. Resurrection. Resurrection. Amen to that? Resurrection. That is the, the, the main difference of our belief. Christianity and other belief of other world religion. Resurrection. All leaders of the so-called world religion, what are they? They are still six feet under the ground but not your lord and savior jesus christ because he is risen amen to that amen to that and because he was resurrected and he is written and seated at the right hand of god until this very day we have hope but those other world religion they do not they do not have hope because they put their hope on the creation of the mighty god not like you and i we have this hope. Okay. 
the, the resurrected Jesus is what separates us from the rest of the religion of this world. For it gives us a living hope while other believes dead hope. It is a dead hope and a dead end. And because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is now an assurance of the forgiveness of our sins according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But since Christ was risen from the dead, we have the forgiveness of our sins. We are no longer in our sins. Unfortunately, my dear brethren and friends, despite all Jesus did, even showing himself to many people that truly he is God, many still didn't believe in him. You know, until he went back to heaven to take his rightful place in God, right uh, beside God and in heaven, you know, until that very moment, people mocked Jesus Christ. This we can see in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 22, 23 our scripture reading, part of the scripture reading. The Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. With so many signs, even they have seen these miracles of Jesus Christ, they still did not believe in Jesus Christ. Now his ultimate signs is his death on the cross and his resurrection. And now Paul said they were still asking for a sign. But what kinds of signs are they really asking? Again, they do not have any idea what were they looking for. Why? Because they don't want to believe in the first place in Jesus Christ. Okay? And no signs will ever satisfy them because they really don't care about Jesus Christ. Christ. No. Now, the reason I said that because now look at the following statement of Apostle Paul. Jesus was, he was a stumbling block. You know, a stumbling block for the Jews. Okay. You know, they will never believe in Jesus Christ. Even how many signs he put up, they will never believe in him. They regarded the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as an offense. As an offense, now what does that mean? Okay, for so long, you know, the Israelites, the Jews, for so long, okay, they regarded themselves as inferior and had always been in captivity. When a prophecy of a king, when they heard a prophecy that a king would come, you know, they were excited. They were excited. But unfortunately, their excitement went down because they were expecting someone who would march in Jerusalem with many horsemen and this man would be in front, a victorious looking man, a regal man. But Jesus did not come that way. He was born in a manger. Okay? They were looking for a valiant king. They were expecting a king who would overthrow Rome and finally gave them political, uh, social, economic, and social you know, advantages. But it did not happen. Okay, they, they, they see Jesus being, you know, seeing Jesus born, seeing Jesus live, seeing Jesus die. He was not something for them to be proud of. They are not proud of one of their own, a Jew. They were not proud of Jesus Christ, especially since Jesus Christ died through crucifixion. Can you imagine a kind of death that belongs only to a hardened criminal? That's why Jesus was a stumbling block to the Jews. Now the Greeks, on the other hand, they look for wisdom. The Greeks were known for pursuit of wisdom, all right? because of their high education. And Jesus, he, he never suited in the ranks because for them, Jesus, he, he is not that intelligent at all. 
you know, because Jesus was never a student of any philosophical schools at that time. Now, looking for wisdom is not something bad at all. They were looking for wisdom. It's not something really bad at all. But what is bad and unfortunate is the rejection of God's wisdom, thinking that they were more superior than God and had pretty much nothing to learn and gain from Jesus Christ. That's what made it wrong. But to ask for wisdom, there's nothing wrong with that. It, what made it wrong, they think they are above Jesus Christ. Now, the message of the cross never appealed to the Greeks because they had so many gods you know, who would deliver them. And for them, it was foolishness. It was foolishness because, number one, they could not fathom the thought of someone claiming to be God dying. Number two, how would, how would mankind live through Jesus' death when Jesus himself wasn't able or wasn't capable of saving himself? Number three, for the Greeks, there is nothing glorious about the cross except shame and agony. That's why the cross was foolishness to them. But nonetheless, nonetheless, Paul continues to preach Jesus when Paul said, but we preach Christ crucified. Instead of trying to satisfy both the Jews and the Greeks, what they demanded, Paul gave them Jesus Christ. Paul gave them a crucified Christ, which was a huge surprise for the Jews and the Greeks. Paul pointed them to the Messiah, to a dying Messiah. Now, whatever they think about Jesus Christ, it didn't matter to Apostle Paul, for he just wanted to continue preaching, and he was preaching to them the doctrine of salvation by a crucified Christ. Now, I do believe that every tongue and every mouth of Jesus' servants should preach the crucified Christ. And I want to encourage all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, to preach the crucified Christ. Preach the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? Why are we supposed to preach the cross of Jesus Christ? Because on that cross is Jesus Christ. And who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the power and wisdom of God unto salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24. You know, they may think that the cross is foolishness. But for you and I, it opened our eyes and gave us wisdom to see how wretched we are and how sinful we are. They thought of the cross as weakness, but we saw it as our strength, for it gave us hope. They saw the cross as a stumbling block, but I saw the cross as an opportunity for my freedom. Freedom from my sins and freedom from the devil's foothold. They saw the cross as an offense. I saw it as my way to heaven. Sign or miracles were performed to bring our attention to Jesus and to Jesus alone and towards his salvation. That's ultimately what it wants to achieve. The Bible tells us that Jesus performed many other miracles in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by believing, what? You may have life in his name. That is the very purpose of the signs, miracles, and wonders in the Bible. Now we have heard and read the story of the rich man and Lazarus when he was suffering he begged he begged for Abraham in verse 38 father Abraham he said but if someone from the dead goes to them they will repent now Abraham said to, the, to him if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets they will not be convinced even someone raises from the dead if a person died, as they say, that's it. That's it. 
No more coming back to life. No more miracle workers that can bring you back to life. Okay. Look at what happened to the rich man. He was asking for Abraham because he was suffering in the afterlife. We have now the Bible, my dear brethren. You have now the Bible with you in all completeness. Jesus gave his final act when he died and when he rose again. It was such a big act that it drew so much attention and it drew so much, uh, so many followers to Jesus Christ. Now I hope that those who have not yet accepted Jesus Christ, you see the cross as your way toward your freedom from your sins and your way to heaven. I hope and pray that you are not still waiting for a sign from heaven to accept Jesus now as your savior because none will be given except that was given the sign of Jonah when he died on the cross for you. I hope you will see the cross. I hope you will see the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ultimate show of his power and authority that that will save you and that you would come to him right this very moment. Now, don't be like the Jews who saw it as an offense and the Greeks who saw it as a foolishness. What awaits them in the end is eternal damnation in hell. Remember, when you accepted Jesus and you put to death your old sinful self with him on the cross, remember this in Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then also he will appear or you will also appear with him in glory if you will give your life to jesus christ today right this very moment my dear friends you will also appear with him in glory you don't need any miracles coming from heaven you are now hearing the word of god you are now reading and listening to the very word of god it is not by chance that you are here and listening to the word of God. I hope you would come and accept Jesus as your Lord and save you, repent of your sins and be baptized. The gospel is yours. Thank you, my dear brethren and friends and those who are in Zoom. Thank you very much for your listening ears again. And shall we all stand up as we sing the song of invitation. God bless everybody.